Well, hello, friends. Dr. Randy Lane Bunch, your pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're so delighted you're able to join us for the broadcast today. And before we get into the message, which we believe will be a great blessing to your life, we want to just remind you of the resources we have available for you at our website, randylanebunch.org. That's the Connecting Point Communications website. And under the media link, you'll find our blog, our podcast, past editions of this television broadcast, as well as a plethora of other resources free and available to you. You can also purchase our book, The Good, The Beautiful, and The True. If you look under the About link, you'll find a place where you can find out about our books. You can also purchase it from Amazon, Apple iBook, uh, and other booksellers as well. But The Good, The Beautiful, and The True is a series of 52 devotional essays that really deal with some of the challenges the church in America and in the West in general is facing. We talk about secularism, the encroaching moral relativism that we see in our culture today, affecting the morals that we're taught and that our children are taught. How can we adequately defend the gospel in a climate like we find today in our culture? Well, we can do it. The Word of God tells us how, and many of the essays that we write in this deal with that. Some of them are just fun, humorous stories that always have a spiritual point, but some of them really deal with the hard-hitting issues of today. We believe it'd be a blessing to you, so go to our website. As we said under the About link, you'll find out about our books. The Good, the Beautiful, the True can also be purchased digitally as an e-book or as a paperback on Amazon.com. We believe it'd be a great blessing to you. We also have our magazine, Connecting Point Magazine. This is kind of the flagship publication of the ministry. We've been publishing this now for several years. We believe it would be a great blessing to you. Digital copies are available on the website. Again, under the media link, you'll find a place where you can find Connecting Point Magazine. You can download a digital copy. And again, we deal with a lot of the challenges that the American church and the church in the West in general is facing. And we have a lot of resources there uh, that will be a great blessing to you. Well, today we're going to minister on the Word made flesh. And we're going to see how not only did this happen 2,000 years ago with Jesus in Bethlehem as he was born in a manger, but how God is still bringing forth his word and his purposes and bringing them into the material universe today as faith-filled men grab a hold of what God says to them and act out in faith and do what God tells them to do. But of course, we want to begin with this story in Luke chapter 1, where we read about the incarnation, about Jesus becoming flesh for you and I. And here we read in Luke 1, beginning with verse uh, 26, We read this. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? In other words, this is a question of process. How are you going to accomplish this? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. I want you to notice, with God, nothing is impossible. And here we see a process of how God accomplishes his will, not only in first century Palestine, but even today in our lives as well. You see, here Jesus is uh, born through the partnership, if you will, of God using someone who has enough faith to receive the word of God, believe it, and and yield to God's purpose and plan for their lives. You know, so much of the time we hear about the sovereignty of God, and God is sovereign, God can do all things, and certainly we understand that God is sovereign in the sense that his plan is ultimately carried out. But friend, what we also need to realize is God always partners with people who will take hold of his promises, who will take hold of his word in faith, believe it, and walk in the light of that truth until his purposes are made manifest in the physical earth. And I think we need to realize that that's what he wants to do with you and I. God is still speaking. In fact, you know, when Jesus uh, faced Satan in the wilderness temptations, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth present tense, out of the mouth of God. God's still speaking. He's still accomplishing his kingdom purposes in the earth today. What begins as a dream or desire in the heart of God is ultimately communicated to we, his people, and as we act in faith on what he tells us to do, uh, the word can be made flesh, and the purposes of God can be made manifest. Really, if you think about it, this is the exact same process by which we're born again. In fact, I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 
You know, we know in John 1.18, the Bible said that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the Word made flesh. And that angel brought that Word to Mary, and Mary believed it, and it became the seed, if you will, that was fertilized in her womb by the Holy Spirit, and the Word was made flesh. Christ came forth. But notice what the Bible says here in 1 Peter 1.23. It says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. That word seed in 1 Peter 1.23 is the Greek word sperma. So in other words, when we hear the word of God, that seed of the very life and nature of God is, is planted in our hearts. But it's when we believe in the promise that the Holy Spirit who is hovering about us to bring conviction and persuasion of the word of God, he re does a work of regeneration and literally Christ is born in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God's life and nature is born in you. But it's his word coming, the spirit of God hovering over that word to bring conviction and confirmation of the truth of the reality of the Word of God. And as we believe it, the Word of God is fertilized by faith, and through the Holy Spirit, regeneration transpires, and Christ is born in us. Again, the Word is made flesh. And every time we take hold of the Word of God, and allow our minds to be renewed, or take hold of the direction of God for our lives, and walk it out in faith, again and again, the Word of God is made flesh, and the kingdom realities become a physical manifestation as we begin to walk out the realities of God's truth in His Word in our lives. I want you to notice that this is exactly Exactly what the great heroes of faith did again and again and again. In fact, let's go ahead and look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, this great hall of faith, these men of God who took hold of the promises of God and steadfastly stood on them and walked in the light of that truth until God's promises became a physical reality in the earth. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we read, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders, talking about all these great heroes of faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. For by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are uh, seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, again, going back to verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things, not, uh, things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've always liked the new American Standard Translation of verse 1 much better. It says it this way, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I like that. The conviction of things not seen. You see, friend, faith always deals with what you can't yet see and what you don't yet have. If you can see it, if you have it, you don't need faith for it. But when God gives a promise, we don't see it in manifestation yet, but we have the assurance, we have the conviction of things not seen because God gave us that promise. And we have an expectation, a hope that they will come to pass because we have faith in what God has told us. And the Bible said that all these elders, these great men of faith, uh, obtained a good testimony, obtained a good report with God because of their faith. Now, I remember years ago uh, hearing a Bible teacher say that he couldn't quite understand verse 3 because it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. And it sounds very much like God is talking about the creation of the universe, how through his word he spoke the universe, the worlds, the planets into existence. And of course we know that he did that. In fact, he created the world ex nihilo, meaning he created it out of nothing, which is exactly what this verse says, that the things which are visible came out of things which are not visible. It came out of the word of God, and that's all very true. But as this author said in his book, he made a great point about this word worlds. It's actually the Greek word aeons, and it really means ages or time periods. And really, really what the author here is saying of Hebrews is this, that all the respective time periods in which these elders, these great men of faith were uh, living, each one of these time periods, each one of these ages in which Enoch and Noah and Abraham and all these great men of faith lived, these ages were shaped, framed, formed, and fashioned through faith through the word of God, as these men heard from the Lord, believed him, and walked out the reality of his promises until it became a physical reality in the earth. If you think about it, for Noah, it was a big boat. God told him, I'm going to bring judgment to the earth. And the Bible said that Noah, for a hundred years, was a preacher of righteousness. So with one hand, he's hammering, and the other hand, he's preaching to that sinful generation, letting them know that judgment is coming to the earth. But even though he had never seen rain, even though it had never rained before, Noah, on the basis of the word of God, began by faith to act out what God said, and pretty soon there was a kingdom reality sitting in his backyard, a giant boat that became the salvation of the eight members of his family that lived through the flood.
flood. For Abraham, it was a bouncing baby boy. God gave him a promise. He said, you know, your, your heir is going to inherit your, your goods. And uh, at that time, he didn't have a child. And of course, he's aging. And God gave him the promise at 75. But as the years tick by, Abraham isn't seeing a son. And finally, he's 100 years of age. He has no natural means whatsoever of bringing the promise to pass. But the Bible said against hope, he believed in hope. If you look in Romans chapter 4, it says that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God promised, he was able also to perform. And because he had faith in the word of God, the, the word of God became flesh, and Abraham was cradling that baby boy. You know, you can't kiss a promise. You, you can't rock a promise to sleep. You can't give a promise an inheritance. But if you have faith in the word, if you have faith in the promise, God will cause the word to be made flesh. And that's exactly what he did because Abraham was confident that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And again and again, we see the great men of God bringing forth the promises of the Lord. For Moses, it was a nation liberated. I mean, Moses was a fellow who couldn't even talk that well. He kept trying to talk God out of his calling because he said, Lord, your servant can't even speak. Uh, and, and besides, I'm a fugitive. Lord, my, my picture's on every post office uh, you know, wall in Egypt. I'm a fugitive. I'm a wanted man. And the Lord said, that's okay. I'm going to use you to deliver a people out of Egypt and bondage. And so Moses believed the promise of God and 10 plagues later, the nation of Israel came out not as captives, but as free men with the wealth of Egypt in their hands. And the Bible said that there was not a single feeble soul among their tribes. God brought them out with a high hand. Joshua, it was a land inherited. Uh, the generation that came out of uh, Egypt with Moses didn't believe the promise and their bodies died in the wilderness because they wouldn't take God at his word and inherit the land. But God God raised up Joshua to be just like Moses. And he said, you will inherit the land, you and your generation. And those people believed God. And one by one, those cities in Canaan fell. Uh, Jericho and Ai and all the other cities fell one by one as the people of God acted in faith on what God said and they inherited the land. And today, the people are still in the land. God's people, the Jews, are still in that land that he gave them thousands of years ago because of a handful of faith-filled folk who believed God, took them on his promise. I love Caleb. You know, when Caleb was 40 years of age, he was one of the few that said, we can take the land. And even though the generation that he was a part of died and their bodies were buried in the wilderness because Caleb believed uh, he was able to go in at 85 years of age. And he told Joshua, I'm just as strong today to take the land as I was 40 years ago. And because he was a man of faith, God sustained him and strengthened him. And the word to Caleb was made flesh and he became uh, an heir of the land that God had promised him and the children of Israel. Again and again, Again and again, we see these beautiful examples of people causing the word to become flesh through their faith as God and his power moved mightily through them to accomplish his purposes in the earth. And friend, God's not done. He still wants to continue to accomplish his purposes in the earth today, and he will. But how many of you know not everyone fulfills the purpose of God. There are those who don't believe. There are those who refuse to take God at his word and see his promises fulfilled. As we said, the nation that came out, or the generation that came out of Egypt with Moses did not inherit the land because they didn't believe God. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, we read about them. In fact, he likens them unto us. And this is what the author of the Hebrews said in Hebrews 4, 2. For indeed the gospel is preached to us as well as to them. See, they had a gospel of their own. It was a promise of the promised land. So it says, for indeed the gospel is preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now, if you remember the story, you can read about it in Numbers chapter 13, how Moses sent spies into the land to check out the land of Canaan to see how they would go in and possess the land. And they brought back the fruit of the land. And they said, you know, it's just like God said, uh, the, it's beautiful, it's bountiful, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. They bought, brought back a, a big bunch of grapes that were so large it took two men to carry them between the stick, uh, on a stick between the two of them. And you know, I thought that was maybe hyperbole when I used to read that in the scriptures. But recently I just saw a picture of a bunch of grapes from the land of Israel and it's literally larger than a man. And so I can see exactly how they had to carry that bunch of grapes out on a pole between two of them and they said even though it's such a great land we can't take the land because the giants are there so rather than looking to the promise they look to the obstacles friend listen anytime God calls you to do something for him 
There's going to be obstacles. But what in the world does that have to do with the promise of God? The promise of God is not limited by any physical, man-made, or natural obstacle. The Word of God is supernatural, and if we'll believe in the promise of God, He'll cause the Word to become flesh. And of course, ultimately, they did through Joshua, and they brought to pass the Word of God. And yet, that generation that came out of Egypt with Moses did not inherit the land. They died, and their bodies were buried in that wilderness simply because they got their eyes on the giants rather than on the promise of God. It's interesting, as they talked about that, they said, you know, we were like grasshoppers in their sight, and so we were in their sight. And uh, I always wondered, how did they know that? Did they go down and poll the giants? Did they ask him, excuse me, sir, uh, Mr. Giant, do I look like a grasshopper to you? Of course not. They began to project the image they had of themselves onto their enemies simply because they got talked out of their faith. And friend, we always need to keep the proper image of ourselves and our circumstances and who God is by looking to the word and the promise of God, not looking at the obstacles. The more you look at the obstacles, whatever you focus on will get larger. Whatever you magnify will get bigger. So magnify God, magnify his promises, and they'll grow larger in your heart. And pretty soon the impossibilities will see like, seem like nothing more than a speed bump uh, because of your faith in the word of God. Now, now contrast their response uh, to failing to enter into the promised land because of the obstacles with that of another great man of God, and that is Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was a man who was a leader of the nation of Israel going back into the land after Babylonian captivity. And he went back with a group of Israelis to help begin to build the temple and rebuild the nation. And uh, the prophet Zechariah came alongside of Zerubbabel to encourage him. In fact, both Haggai and Zerubbabel were raised up by God to encourage them because they also faced opposition. They had local opposition from their neighbors who did not want to see uh, the temple rebuilt. They did not want to see the prosperity of Jerusalem. Nehemiah ran into the exact same problems when he began to build up the gates and the city walls, uh, but they began to get discouraged. And so for a while, they left off the building of the temple and Haggai came, Haggai came along and began to prophesy and said, this is why your harvests are meager. This is why that you sow much and yet bring in very little because you've left my house to rot while you're building your own houses and taking care of your own things. Now get your priorities right. Go back and build my house, the Lord says, and I'll bless you. And he did exactly that. And so this is one of the prophecies where Zechariah prophesied to Zerubbabel to encourage him in the work of God in rebuilding of the temple. And this is Zechariah 4, beginning with verse 6. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Now what he's saying is, Zerubbabel, you're not going to accomplish this according to your own might, according to your own ability, according to your own resources, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that's why he said, you're going to speak to this mountain of obstacles and say grace, grace unto it. Why? Because grace is God's ability in you to do what you don't have the ability to do. And so to all the obstacles we face in accomplishing the purposes of God, when we carry out the promises of God, when we're walking in faith according to the direction we've received of him. The mountains might loom large in front of us, but friend, we just need to say grace, grace to the mountain. In other words, God's going to put me over by his spirit, by his ability, by his unique power in my life. He's called me. He's going to anoint me. And if God's called me, who can be against me? And we need to shout, shout grace, grace to the mountains and the obstacles that we face, and they will become a plain. In fact, he goes on to say that he will set the capstone on it. Again, uh, he says in verse 7, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The capstone is the final stone that you set when everything else is done. He said, Zerubbabel, your hands have started this thing, and your hands are going to finish it, because my grace, my power, and my ability is going to put you over in this work that I've called you to do. Friend, we're to do the exact same thing. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he will have whatever he says. And friend, when we believe in God and his promises, we can stand strong and speak to the mountains of adversity and they'll begin to cave. I remember friends years ago after I pastored my first church, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me to go into the traveling ministry. And uh, I had never traveled before. I didn't really know how to do it. I just had to rely on the promise of God. 
but I began to act in faith on what God told me to do. And I began to call pastors and I began to get diligent. I began to send packets out. I began to let people know I'm in the traveling ministry. I'd like to come preach for you. And I got so much rejection. I got so many no's. I had to overcome mountains of obstacles all the time. I had to keep speaking to myself and telling me this was God's big idea. God's going to put me over. And you know he did. In fact, he began to deal with me about going to New England and pastoring or rather uh, traveling in the uh, New England states. And so I began to send out packets and I began to call pastors. And that first year I got enough meetings to go for one month and one week. And uh, we were diligent. We had great meetings with those pastors. And that one month and one week turned into three months the following years. And we eventually established a very blessed traveling ministry. We spent a lot of time in New England as well as other uh, states in the East Coast as well as the West Coast. We were all over the country and even went overseas doing Holy Ghost meetings and ministering in local churches. And we established a, a solid traveling ministry on nothing but the Word of God and acting in faith of what God called us to do, the word was made flesh. But I remember the day when the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, okay, you're done with the traveling ministry. I want you to come to the state of Vermont and start a church. And so once again, we just had to act in faith. And so we moved halfway across the country and we began just plowing. And I'm telling you again, we had mountains and obstacles. Uh, I remember, you know, for the first six months, we had about one family and then another family came. We were so excited to get our second family. And then they took off for the winter to go down to Florida. We call them snowbirds. Uh, they leave Vermont in the wintertime because of the harsh conditions. They go down, enjoy the Florida sunshine. So we're back to one family again. And then we get another couple of families and one of them leaves. It was two steps forward, three steps back. But we just continued to persevere. And before long, we had this beautiful church. And I remember years before that, um, I was still in the traveling ministry looking to make this transition into pastoring in Vermont. And uh, God had spoken to me about Vermont actually years ago, even before we entered the traveling ministry. And I would put together uh, jigsaw puzzles of the state of Vermont. Everywhere I'd go, I would see Vermont or, or New England everywhere I went. It, I remember going down to Los Angeles to do a meeting one time, and I saw Vermont Avenue and New Hampshire Boulevard. I couldn't go anywhere without seeing the word of the Lord speaking to my heart and reaffirming that call to go to New England. And like I said, we traveled there. But then when God called us to start that church, as I said, we just faithfully obeyed him. And I mean, the conditions are harsh. I mean, we were uh, hauling this heavy sound equipment up across ice-covered parking lots, sometimes for just two other people besides our family. And like I said, sometimes we'd have families come and then families go. But over a period of time, we established that church. And I'll never forget, friends, we were in... Um, a new facility. We had been renting hotel rooms and it was good. We'd grown, but we finally rented our first facility. Uh, it wasn't going to be a hotel room. It was going to be ours. And so we had a day where we were painting it and fixing it up. We moved in our chairs, set up our sound equipment. And all of a sudden I just stopped and I had to say and realize this is exactly what I've been preaching about. This is the word made flesh. God had spoken to me when I was still in the traveling ministry. I want you to go to Vermont. I want you to start that church. And as we acted in faith, Little bit by little bit, God brought into manifestation the kingdom reality in physical form that he had placed in our heart of having a church in the state of Vermont. We passed that church for 10 years. And I remember on that day as we were cleaning the church and fixing it up and painting it and getting it ready for our first service, one of the gentlemen testified and talked about what a great blessing that church had been to him in the time that he had been there. And I thought, again, this is the word made flesh. This is the word becoming a reality in his life because we believe the word of God to us to go and plant this church. And the, the unseen kingdom reality in the heart of God to have a church in Vermont became a physical reality because we believed the word of God, the Holy Spirit empowered us to do it, and the word of God became flesh. I remember um, when I began writing books more recently, I'd written a book some 20 plus years ago, but more, more recent times God told me to write up a very particular book. And uh, I said, okay, I'm going to do that. I, I sat down at the typewriter and I pounded that thing out. About two months later, we had the book done, went through the publishing process. And again, I remember holding that book in my hand. And once again, I realized this is the word made flesh because God had spoken to me. I want you to take those radio broadcasts you've been doing on the California Central Coast. And I want you to turn it into a manuscript and publish a book. And so I took the word that God gave me and I just acted in faith on what he told me to do. Found a publisher who has now become a dear friend of mine, a very important connection to my life. But now today we can hold that book in our hand, the word made flesh, simply because God gave us a promise that we acted on in faith. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, shouting grace, grace to all the obstacles, it came to pass and became a reality in our lives. Friend, God wants to do the same thing in and through you. God still has kingdom realities he wants to bring into physical manifestation in this earth. And right now they're just a dream in the heart of God, or maybe they're a dream in your heart. God's given you a vision. God's given you a plan to step out and obey him in some area of service. 
And right now it's not a reality. But friend, if you'll take hold of the promise of God and day by day, diligently go in and begin to work on that in faith. You know, some people say, well, God's called me. I'm just going to wait till God brings it to pass. That was never my approach. And I don't believe that was the approach of the great men of faith. I believe like Abraham, they picked up and took off and started moving in that direction. And Abraham inherited land he didn't even know. Eventually, a nation came out of him because he believed a promise God gave him that he'd have a child. But it all started with him getting in motion, beginning to act in the light of what God had promised him and what he had told him. And friend, I want you to encourage you, particularly as we come into 2020, begin to take hold of the Word of God. Begin to take hold of God's direction in your life and begin to act on it in faith. And as you do, the unseen realities of the kingdom and become a physical reality in this earth where lives can be touched just like that gentleman testifying in my church in Vermont all those years ago. God still has vision for me. I don't know about you, but I still have things that I know God's placed in my heart that he wants to become a physical reality. And I'm going to have to act in faith and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God to shout down all the mountains of resistance. But I'm telling you, friend, we'll accomplish the purposes of God if we'll take him at his word. I want to take a moment just to pray for you, for those of you that maybe need healing in your body. Every week we take an opportunity to pray for those those who don't know Christ and who need healing in their body. So if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want to pray a very simple prayer with you. If you believe that Jesus died on your behalf and that, that he bore your sins for you to be sin sacrificed to pay your debt, and if you believe that God raised him from the dead to be the Savior of those who will call upon him, friend, you can be saved. If you're really ready and willing to accept Christ in your heart, I want to ask you to pray a very simple prayer with me. Just say this, say it from your heart, mean it with all your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, that's right, just say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. And right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Father. Jesus, come into my heart. Change me. Transform me. Make me brand new. I repent of my sins. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior, and I confess you as my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you pray that prayer, I want to hear from you. Email me at info at connectingpc.org. And we also want to pray for you. If you need healing in your body, we're going to pray for you right now. So just extend your hands toward the TV screen, the computer screen, whatever you're watching. We're going to pray and believe God for a miracle in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my friends watching this broadcast right now. Father, I pray with all of my heart that your healing virtue, your power, your anointing would go right through that television screen, that computer screen, that device screen. I pray that you would touch them by your mind power. I command pain and discomfort to leave their bodies now. I command uh, deaf ears to hear, blind eyes to see. I thank you for making the cripple to walk. I thank you, Father God, for straightening spinal cords and repairing back injuries. I thank you, Father God, for healing bursitis, Father God. I thank you for healing arthritis in the name of Jesus. Thank you for restoring those, Father God, who've had tibular meningitis. I command the pain to depart, for their bodies to be made whole, to be made straight in the name of Jesus. We take authority over every evil spirit afflicting and plaguing the people of God. We thank you for delivering them from oppression, Father. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we're so delighted that you tuned into the broadcast. Don't forget uh, to go on our website, randylanebunch.org. Again, we have so many resources available. Our book, The Good, The Beautiful, and The True, is available on Amazon. You can also just go to our website, randylanebunch.org. Under the About link, you'll find our books. Just click on the links there. It'll take you right to Amazon, Apple iBooks. Uh, Barnes and Noble. You can get digital copies several places. Paperback only at Amazon. So if you want a paperback copy, go to Amazon.com and just simply look up Randy Lane Bunch. And when you do, you'll find our other books as well. The Gospel Saving Power, uh, Immutable, uh, Changeless Truth for a Changing World, which is all, another book of devotional essays. That's there and available as well. And then, of course, our magazine, Connecting Point Magazine. This is the fall 2019 edition. Uh, in January, we'll have the winter edition out uh, for 2020. Man, how the year fly by. But friend, we want you to be resourced. We want you to have what you need so that you can walk in the victory that Christ has secured and purchased for you. We love you. We believe God for you. We believe God's going to do great things in your life in 2020. But always remember as we celebrate the birth of Christ, as we celebrate this Christmas season, always remember the reason for the season, that Jesus came and was born in that Bethlehem manger so that he might one day become the sacrifice of sin for all of us, that we might have life in his name. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next time on Connecting Point.